The unknown. Is this something we can cover? Do we even know what we are doing? Is this even necessary? Welcome to Superhero Rundown. I'm Crimson, and today we'll be looking at if and how audio dramas count as live action media. I think that they do. Why? Because they can sometimes do a much better job than visual media to convey stories. You can imagine it as you hear the words. Listen to this description. West of Arkham, the hills rise wild, and there are valleys with deep woods that no axe has ever cut. There are dark, narrow glens where the trees slope fantastically, and where thin brooklets trickle out without ever having caught the glint of sunlight. On the gentler slopes, there are farms, ancient and rocky, with squat, moss-coated cottages brooding eternally over all New England secrets in the lee of great ledges. But these are all vacant now, the wide chimneys crumbling and the shingled sides bulging perilously beneath low gambrel roofs. Now, is it better to imagine or should I show an image on screen? I expect it's better to imagine and rightfully so. You can imagine the slopes and the hills. I don't need to show you pictures of these things because everything you imagine about it is subtly tailored to what you think looks the best. Not only that, but I know my director has a lot of trouble looking at faces, and she has become a very avid listener of audio works because of it. It allows her to enjoy suspenseful moments, horrific monsters, and high action scenes without triggering things that make her unable to consume most other forms of media. Podcasts as audio dramas are a rapidly growing industry. And yes, podcast listenership is still on the rise. Nicholas Qua explains why. At any rate, it's worth introducing some level of complexity to that feeling. Not all shows possess a regular weekly publishing cadence. Not all shows should be built to compete for everybody's regular listening slots, and not all niches are adequately covered in the current spread of what's available. One of the most recent audio dramas I tried out was Neil Gaiman's The Sandman, and let me tell you how much I needed this in my life. I really enjoyed it, and it is hard to adapt. I am a bit nervous about the Netflix adaptation, because the audio drama did an excellent job at the content. Barely anything changed from the original text. Neil himself even explained that the Audible adaptation hasn't required him to compromise the audacity, the ambiguity, or the endearing strangeness of the comic. It took me a week to listen through it, and only because I had to stop to do other things that were stupid and nothing to do with the Sandman. And to DC's credit, in Sweet Dreams, Neil Gaiman's The Sandman becomes an audio drama, Neil says, Everybody at DC understands that this is my thing and I'm identified with it, and that it is much better to have me working on it because then it will be better, and I want to be on board. It's not only famous works either. Welcome to Night Vale started out small and grew into a phenomenon. This on-air representation is driven by the behind-the-scenes creatives who aren't hampered by the gatekeepers of the publishing, TV, or film industry. With podcasts, you don't have to get a publisher to okay what you want to write. You don't have to get a studio to approve your script. I can make this and nobody has to say yes to me making it, says Fernandez Collins. Some notable podcasts that are audio dramas are King Falls AM, Welcome to Night Vale, obviously, Neil Gaiman's The Sandman, also obviously, Ake Willow, My Dead Wife the Robot Car, The Magnus Archives, The Doctor Who Audio Dramas by Big Finish, The Bright Sessions, and so many others. I couldn't possibly name them all. And some may have noticed that I am not on camera this time. To give a fully audio drama experience, I decided not to do this on camera so that my voice comes through to provide the atmosphere of an audio drama, and so commenters can't make fun of my being on camera. Die mad about it, nerds. But what makes audio dramas so damn compelling? The listener's imagination completes the acoustic input to construct places and settings in the storyline and links these images to the everyday world. 
Therefore, sound consists of not only the acoustic stimulus, but also a narrative element that can be linked to literary geographies. Sound is so important because it not only helps shape individuals' view of the world, but either deafeningly loud or quiet as a mouse, is of historic significance. Big noises like cannons, church bells, steam engines, and jets have changed history as much as bold proclamations. So have small sounds pronounced in whispers at clandestine meetings, as Stefan Zimmerman and Torts and Wiseman have pointed out in their article, Sound and Media, Audio Drama, and Audio Guided Tours as Stimuli for the Creation of Place. Yes, much like the colors an action drawing on a comic page can bring the superhero to life, so too can the sound of Cat Dennings as death, Cecil Baldwin as Cecil, and even Christopher Eccleston returning as the Ninth Doctor. There's no limit to comics, there's no limit to live-action superhero media, and there's no limit to audio dramas. That is why audio dramas count as live-action media. I look forward to the arguments in the comments that I won't be reading.